Uh, praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, praise the Lord. And we uh, we thank you for joining us for another Central Jersey Bible Institute Encouragement Series session. Uh, we truly do thank the Lord for uh, creating a way for us to be able to come together as an assembly uh, for the sole purpose of uh, uh, going into depth, uh, the bread of life, uh, that we may be able to dine on the things of God and to uh, come into an understanding um, of him, to learn of him. Uh, and to become better acquainted uh, with his majesty. Uh, truly, uh, this is a blessing, and uh, we should definitely not take it for granted. Uh, this evening, uh, praise the Lord, our instructor will be uh, the pastor of GRCC, as well as the president of the Central Jersey Bible Institute and the person of Elder John Betts. Um, and, but before we turn the service over into his hand, let us go before the throne of grace and petition that the Lord will bless us with his presence. In Jesus' name, let every heart pray. Uh, Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we love and thank you. We ask, Lord, that you would look upon us with great favor. We're here, Lord God, for the sole purpose of coming into a better knowledge of you, to receive, Lord God, that which you would have to give unto your sheep this evening. We know, Lord God, that the food that you have to administer unto us is just what we need to have so that we uh, can be functional, so that we can receive of all of the good uh, that is destined upon us because you have said that my children are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This is an opportunity to receive the knowledge so that we may not be destroyed. We ultimately hope to become vessels unto honor for you, uh, well pleasing in your sight, friends of yours. We ask, Lord, that this be a stepping stone towards that. We ask also that you bless every participant on the call, that you rebuke uh, the devil away from us uh, so that we may be able to learn without distraction. That, Lord God, you will supply uh, our needs naturally and spiritually, not only to us, but to our home, uh, that you will continue to make it harmonious, that you would bless all the prayer requests, that you would bless the church with boldness and love, Lord God, and the identity uh, that you are looking for as your bride. But we thank you. We ultimately ask that you keep us rapture ready. We do ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord again unto you all and giving honor to the Lord who is the head of my and our lives. Uh, praise the Lord unto the pastor of the house and the person of Elder John Betts and to his, his wife, First Lady uh, Loria Betts, to Mother Harrell. Uh, and on behalf of the Central Jersey Bible Institute board, we say praise the Lord unto you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And without further ado, I now turn the service over to the hands of our instructor for the evening, again, in the person of Pastor Elder John Betts, in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord and good evening to all. Indeed, we do honor the Spirit of Christ as head in our life. We honor our clergy and to our deacons, our brethren, and to all of their wives, to my wife, Sister Loria. Amen. To the church mothers. Amen. The mother of the house, Mother Ida Harrell, to the dean of the Central Jersey Bible Institute, Elder Bonet and his staff, to each and every one of you tonight, we honor you, we thank God for you, and we do thank God for another opportunity that he has allowed us to come together in fellowship in his word. And certainly that's the way I view entering, studying, reading, and appreciating God's word, I view it as a fellowship. We come to the table and we look for him to feed us and to fellowship with one another as we dine on the manna from on high. And so certainly we have prayed and asked the Lord to direct us so that what is given tonight is what he desires for each of us to receive. We continue this evening with our study in terms of unity in the church. And tonight we come to part eight of this series. And as we prepare to enter our lesson for this evening, I also want to honor and thank God for our technician this morning, or this evening. Um, I, I appreciate each and every one of the hosts. Uh, you do uh, an awesome job. It is a challenging job. 
you know, there's that challenge of who to let in, who not to let in. If there's a number you don't recognize, there's the challenge of making sure that things are running properly so that when everyone seeks to log in, they can get in, making sure that the volume is correct. And there's a lot involved uh, dealing with background noise, interference. And so to all of our hosts, I say thank you. We appreciate you. And certainly the Lord will bless you for your labor of love. And so tonight, we come to Unity in the Church, Part 8, and we're going to begin with the theme scripture that we have used for this series, taken from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. And in the King James Version, it reads this way, and he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And that is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. From July 15th to December 16th, we taught part one of this lesson subject, and part one entailed unity is a gift from the Lord. From January 13th to February 10th, we taught part two of this lesson subject, and that entailed unity is maintained, not created by man. When we started on July 15th, we stated there are 10 truths that we find in Ephesians about what church unity is and is not. These 10 truths are, number one, unity is a gift from the Lord. Number two, unity is maintained, not created by man. Number three, unity grows over time. Four, unity is most opposed by pride and self-interest. Five, unity is a uniquely Christian adornment. Six, unity requires a doctrinal center, and that center is 
the gospel. Seven, unity does not mean uniformity. Eight, unity depends on grace and gifts. Nine, unity grows when it is stretched, pressured, and even threatened. And number 10, unity glorifies God and attracts unbelievers. On July 15th, we started with number one, unity is a gift from the Lord and completed this as we stated on December 16th. And so now tonight, we would like to come to part three, the beginning or start part three, number three, in addressing number three of the 10 truths that we find in Ephesians about what church unity is and is not. And number three is unity grows over time. Okay. Unity grows over time. Now, as we go into this lesson tonight, as I stated, we're just a family sitting down at the dinner table and we're in fellowship. So if there's a question, comment, concern, please, you don't have to wait to the end and jot it down and hold it or try to remember it. Uh, just jump right in and we can discuss and, and, and talk on, on his word, all right? So please feel free. Uh, don't feel that it's, it's an interruption or a distraction. Unity grows over time, or at least unity in the church should grow over time. Notice how verse three begins. What we've just read in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, notice how verse three begins, and it, and it goes this way, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Here we see the scripture stressing, maintaining unity. Now that's in verse three. But then verse 13 says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So in Paul's words, we learn unity is not a fixed or stationary thing. Unity is something every church family should pray for and grow in. And, and I don't know if it's thought of that way, but unity is something that every church family should pray for and grow in. We certainly need to pray for unity because our nature is not prone to unity. Generally, our nature is selfish. And when I'm talking about our nature, I'm referring to that old Adamic or Adam nature. It's selfish. It looks out for number one. So in order to keep that nature at bay, we should pray for unity and then grow in it. As the church family submits, and that's what the flesh doesn't want to do. As the church family submits themselves to the truth of the gospel, and the love that comes from the Lord. Growth in unity is the work of the Lord, right? Growth in unity is the work of the Lord. As verse three teaches us, it is the result of prayer 
and the fullness of the spirit. For the church is, if we want to talk about what the real church is, people filled with the Holy Spirit of promise, commissioned to love one another and proclaim the gospel. I'm going to say that again when we talk about the church, because we generally refer to that on two levels. We, we say church when we refer to the building and the congregation. If someone says, what church do you go to? Okay, they're generally referring to the building, the name of that particular church and that church family, that congregation. So we speak of church in that sense, the natural. But then we also speak of church on another plane or another level, which is the spiritual level. And we speak of church as being the mystical or the spiritual body of Christ. So the church is people filled with the Holy Spirit of promise, commissioned to love one another and proclaim the gospel. That is the body of Christ. Right? Now, when we look at the question as we address unity in the church, what is unity? Does it mean that we agree with everyone else in our church on everything? You know, so if someone in the church says, okay, um, this coming Sunday, um, I proclaim that everyone comes to church with a big hat on, male and female. Does it mean we have to agree with that in order to be in unity? No. Unity doesn't mean we agree with everyone else in the church on everything. Does it mean that, you know, we all love the same foods? No. You know, we all have our different likes and dis dislikes. Does it mean we all watch the same TV shows and listen to the same music? No. Of course not. We're all different. And that's reality. We're different and, that, and that's reality. And if we were all the same carbon copies, then why would the Lord need more than one of us? Uh, you know, every joint supplies. The Lord has brought us from unique backgrounds so that we can together accomplish his will and his purpose. Some of us have more relatable experience than others. I think I mentioned this before. Those who may have spent time incarcerated and the Lord allows them to go back and witness to those that are incarcerated their testimony is going to be different from someone who's never experienced that. So we all have backgrounds that the Lord has brought us from, experience and testimonies that vary. So when we talk about unity, it doesn't mean that we're all exactly the same. The spirit is the same, but our personalities, our likes, our dislikes, our feelings are not all the same. So what does it mean to be unified with people who are different from you, from me? What does it mean to be unified? Well, unity in the church is about coming together to form something bigger. Unity in the church is about coming together to form something bigger. You know, I've used this analogy before and I wanna drop it in here again and share it for those who follow sports. There are teams who could have won more championships than they did, but in their star players, someone got it in their mind, I'm great. And people recognize me as the sidekick to this other great player and that I can't win without them. And then they start to try to brand their own name. 
and it breaks up the camaraderie, it breaks up the unity, it separates the focus and goal. And before you know it, they're no longer winning and eventually they're no longer on the same team. Dynasties have been destroyed because of egos. Unity in the church is about coming together to form something bigger. It really doesn't matter if I'm in the background working or if I'm in the forefront working. I'm a part of something that's striving to do something greater. It's recognizing that we're stronger together than we are individually. Scripture confirms that. One can chase a thousand, two Look at the math, 10,000. So we are stronger together than we are individually. It's enjoying fellowship with each other. When we talk about unity, it's enjoying fellowship with each other. As strange as this may sound to some, we ought to be happy when we see one another. You know, not, oh, here she go again. Oh, here he go again. It should be a joy. It should bring a smile to our faces to see one another. You know, as a child of God, you have a target on your back. The enemy is looking to take you out every day the Lord gives you. So if you know you have that struggle, what about your brother? What about your sister? So when you see them, you know they've survived that struggle another day, another week, and, and it ought to bring a smile to your face. It's enjoying fellowship with each other. As we stated, unity in the church is not made by man or mankind. It is maintained by man or mankind. As with any relationship, we have to work continually at maintaining it. That's natural, as well as it is spiritual. Any relationship that we want to be successful, we have to work at it continually to maintain it. You cannot neglect and expect the relationship to work. There has to be a continual maintaining. We often say what it took to receive the Holy Ghost. It'll take that and more to stay in it and have it abide in you. And so it is with unity. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 makes that clear when it commands us to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We should make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Every effort. Now that, that is a mouthful. When you say make every effort, that's a mouthful. And yet that is the word. And that's why we talk about being spiritual because in the flesh, you know, we're not looking to make every effort in our old Adam nature. No, sir. That is in the spirit through the bond of peace. So tonight, as we look at maintaining unity in the church, we want to look at eight ways or begin. I know I won't cover all eight tonight. Uh, so I'll say begin looking at eight ways we can do our part to help maintain and grow unity in the church over time. Number one is of, of these eight ways. Number one, remember our common identity. Number one, remember our common identity. Now, let me pause here for a moment. Those of you who are on Zoom, 
Uh, thank you, Sister Qualls, uh, for uh, displaying the slides. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. So those of you that are on Zoom and you're able to see it, if you notice that I'm repeating, um, it's for those who may be on phone and may be taking notes as opposed to being able to see it on Zoom. Uh, so for those of you that are seeing it on Zoom, if you notice I'm repeating it, it's for those that may be on phone and are jotting it down. So number one, of the eight ways we can do our part to help maintain and grow unity in the church over time. Number one, remember our common identity. It is important to keep our common identity at the forefront. Even though we may disagree or have different opinions on all sorts of things, the key to church unity is being on the same page when it comes to the main thing, okay? Like for an example, when I, when I say that we may disagree or have different opinions on all sorts of things, for an example, we may differ when it comes to which team we root for in sports, okay? Right within the same church family, you may have a Lakers fan and a Celtics fan. And anybody who knows the history of the Lakers and the Celtics who follow sports knows those teams do not like each other. And most of the time the fans don't care for, the, uh, for each other either because they root so passionately for their team. So if you've got a Laker fan and a Celtic fan in the same church family, well, Hey, we differ on which team we root for in sports, but that doesn't change the unity of the spirit. We keep that common identity. We focus on the main thing. Now, when we start to sit down and talk sports, yeah, we may debate a little on which team is better, which has the best history, who had the best players. We may have a little fun debating on that and talking about that. We may differ when it comes to our preference of flavor and ice cream, you know. Some folks are butter pecan. Some folks are Neapolitan. You know, whatever it may be. Some is old-fashioned vanilla. We may differ on that. You know, you, you sit down and talk about what you like, and someone may say, ooh, I can't stand that. You know, we can differ in those areas. We can have those conversations. You know, we may differ in terms of not only just those natural examples, but we may differ when it comes to spiritual or biblical examples, such as the two witnesses. And we heard this last night in our uh, session, our Central Jersey Bible Institute encouragement session with Elder Mark Brantley, as he was dealing with the end times from here to eternity. And he talked about the two witnesses and he said that he feels they are Moses and Elijah. And he mentioned, as, as he brought that up, that some believe it's Enoch and Elijah. We may have that discussion. We may differ. Someone may believe it's Moses and Elijah. Someone may believe it's Enoch and Elijah. You know, you'll find this in Re Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, which reads, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Now, we may talk about this and have discussion on it and bring up points and scriptures of why we believe it's Elijah and Moses or why we believe it's Elijah and Enoch. But at the end of the day, none of these, what we believe about the two witnesses, what sports team we root for, what flavor of ice cream we prefer, at the end of the day, none of these differences or preferences or taste will keep us out of heaven. What flavor of ice cream you like, what team you root for, uh, what, which two witnesses you believe there are, none of those things will keep you out of heaven, nor will it cause someone else to be lost. Those issues there, none of them will cause somebody to be lost. So when we talk about the common identity, the common identity is not about carnal or fleshly matters. We are united by something that goes far beyond our preference or taste or even similarities. You know, sometimes it's not the diversity, it's the similarity. 
you know, sometimes we, we're so similar to somebody, you know, it's like a brother from another mother. You know, we're so similar in personalities and interests. But we're, when we talk about being united by something, it, it goes even further than that. We have been changed by the truth of the gospel and have been adopted into the same spiritual family. That goes way beyond any of those other things we've just mentioned. Way beyond any of those things when you talk about changed by the truth of the gospel. And if I could say this for a moment, I know it was the gospel that changed me, the truth of the gospel. Sitting at Refuge Church of Christ, 600 Grand Avenue on a Sunday morning, and somewhere maybe around the fifth row, and Bishop Michael Greer was preaching about heaven and hell. And I, I didn't care for being at church at that time. That was those days where when you live you know, with a saved parent and they went to church, you went to church. You didn't get to stay home. I didn't want to be there. But the truth of that word hit me that Sunday morning, caught my attention, and I started listening as the word was coming out of Bishop Greer. And it left such a profound impact on me till that Sunday after church, I went home and asked my mother, I said, is hell real? And she said to me, yes, it is. And if you don't receive the Holy Ghost, that's where you're going. And, and you know, I know for a fact that the truth of the gospel changed me. And it brought me into this spiritual family. In Philippians chapter two, verses two through four, let me, let me finish that. It didn't stop there, you know, having been touched by the word and then confirmation through the witness when I asked my mother, then I started seeking the Lord. And the only reason I had to tarry, and we use that word tarry, meaning wait. And in and, and, and our day, the, the missionaries and church mothers and clergy and so forth, they felt that since tarry meant wait, do something constructive while you wait, call on the Lord. So that's why they would put the altar chairs out, the folding chairs out on the altar and let us get on our knees and call on him. And the only reason I did that for a while was because of my unbelief. I hadn't fully repented. But the moment I fully repented, the very second the Lord filled me with the Holy Spirit of promise speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. That's how we enter the spiritual family. We cannot sign our name on the church roll book and become a member here in the physical church and believe that that puts us in the spiritual church. You can join the physical church, but you must be born into the spiritual church. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, we read, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife. Please listen to this. Philippians 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife. We should not be going after one another or vain glory. I'm going to show the people that I'm the best preacher tonight. Really? That sounds like somebody who believes they have the power. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, every man also on the things of others. By being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind, 
together all speak of the same idea, a deep abiding internal unity among the saints. A deep abiding internal unity among the saints. I'm going to say that one more time. A deep abiding internal unity among the saints. Internal unity. Now, there is protocol. There is order. If you join the military, armed services, there's protocol. I mean, there's a uniform. And, and with that uniform, you are expected to have it pressed and presentable, ready for inspection. And to a degree, that mentality is in the church. You belong to a certain auxiliary, they have uniforms. But what I want us to understand tonight or recall is that our uniform does not unify us. When it comes to the clergy, we have what we call civic attire, our black suits, our white collars um, for the elders, and then the ministers have the white tab. Okay, that's our civic attire. So if we're coming to a formal ceremony and we are required to wear our civic attire, when we do that, physically, outwardly, we look unified in our civic attire. But inwardly, there may not be unity. So outward identification and unification by dress code does not signify internal unity. It doesn't signify that. It, a uniform, a dress code does not signify internal unity among the saints. That has to be by submitting to the Holy Spirit. Once Paul addresses what unity is, he then gives a good description on how to maintain and grow unity over time by saying, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. This is the first step to maintaining and growing in unity. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. So, in other words, my view an office. And in order to view that office, most likely I'm viewing the purpose, the person who's holding that office. And it may draw me, it may have an impact on me to the point where I may feel within myself, one day I would like to be like that. Okay, that can certainly happen. How many young women have looked at great missionaries and their service and work for the Lord and said, one day I long to be like that. But they're not saying that out of selfish ambition. They're saying that because they have that passion and desire to serve the Lord. And they want to serve them in the example that they're witnessing. So when we talk about selfish ambition, selfish ambition, I want that position because I want the recognition. I want the financial increase that comes with that selfish ambition. I want my name to be a brand. I want people in every household to know my name. Selfish ambition. So if we can avoid that by submitting in the spirit, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. We should not seek positions because of selfish ambition. We should seek positions in the sense of, Lord, your will be done. And most people 
that really serve the Lord in humility do not look for positions because they know of the responsibility that comes with the positions rather than looking at the selfish aspect of it. Most look at the responsibility and remember the scripture that to whom much is given, much is required. So this is the first step to maintaining and growing unity. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. In the flesh, we are often motivate, motivated by selfish ambition or conceit. And you see this in excessive pride in oneself, self-preoccupation. When this is the case, much of what we do is not done out of love for others, but out of our own desire for advancement or promotion, self ambition Yes, go right ahead. I really hate doing this, even though you said to do it. That's the only reason why I'm doing this. I'm listening Please. to you talk about position and the thing that comes to me about a position that a person desires is the fact that you do not make that position. That position and its requirements make you. You have to come up to what's expected of it. And I mean, even the church realm, whatever it is, that position makes you, you don't make it. It's not about you, it's that position that's making you, you you're duty bound to do what's required. Amen. And, and I do think Mother Jones, that sometimes, I really do think that sometimes from the outside looking in, the cost is not seen. I do think the cost is not seen. And this is a reason why we were taught growing up that when a person receives the Holy Spirit of promise, speaking in tongues, the Spirit of God gives the utterance, we were always taught that you never tell that person, you received the Holy Ghost tonight, you spoke in tongues. We were taught never to tell the person because what happens is they depend on your word. You said I have it. And when the hard and difficult days down the road come, they go back to your word rather than leaning on the Lord for they know it for themselves. So we were always taught, you let them say it, let them tell you. And when it comes to positions, when it comes to advancement, there is so much that you don't know until you need the Lord to bring you to that place. Because when the hard, the difficult, as Mother Jones said, that position makes you, when the crushing and pressing time comes, we can't go to someone else and say, well, you said I was a perfect fit for this position, but I don't think I am. No, we need to know this is of the Lord so that when those days come, we lean on him. We trust in him. We survive in him. It's not about our desire for advancement or promotion. That's not working towards unity because when it's about our desire, and when it's about self-brand and selfish ambition, we'll actually get out of the spirit and we'll do things to our brother or our sister that's ungodly in order to pass them in the rank and line. This only produces empty glory. The Lord doesn't get the glory out of this. This only produces empty glory. When the Holy Spirit is right within a child of God, they are just as content sweeping the church floor as they are delivering the Sunday morning message. Why? Because they're doing it to the glory of God. So that if I'm going to sweep the church floor, I'm going to make sure that this floor is so clean till the Lord is pleased with it. If I'm going to deliver his word on a Sunday morning, I want him to use me so that he is pleased. I don't want selfish ambition to produce empty glory. This type of spirit works against the unity Paul pleaded 
with the Philippians and all saints to have. It works against it. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. It's not about me. It is not about me. It's about us. It is not about me. If we could see it that way, it's not about me. It is about us. We are one in Christ. Weep with those that weep. Rejoice with those that rejoice. In lowliness, Paul said, of mine, let each esteem others better than himself. This is completely contradictory to the attitude and spirit of the world. You know, I, I, I have lost touch with um, boxing, heavyweight boxing. I used to love to keep up with the heavyweight, you know, boxing and who was champ and the different, you know, fights that would be coming and who was better. I used to love keeping up with that, like back in Muhammad Ali's day. And, you know, the Ali Frazier fight, you know, the first one and how dramatic it was with, you know, Ali coming off suspension, Frazier the champ, having never faced Ali, those type of things. But one of the things that intrigued me was pre-fight, leading to the fight, how one will always say, yeah, I'm going to beat him. He, he's not as good as me. He can't handle me. Th there was always that me, 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 me. Even if in the back of their mind, they knew they weren't good enough because there were some fighters that were preparing to fight Mike Tyson that was doing it for a payday. They knew they weren't going to beat him, but yet they were going to camera and say, yeah, I'm going to beat him. They, they, were, they were looking for a paycheck. They knew they were not going to beat this man. It was only a question of whether they would go down in the first round or not, or how many minutes or seconds in the first round. But that's the kind of mentality, you know, when we talk about our nature, you know, we're, we're, we're taught, you know, even children today, they can't stand losing because they're taught you have to win. You're supposed to win. So to esteem others better than ourselves, it's contradictory to the attitude and spirit of the world. Because lowliness of mind is about the least attractive thing to the thinking of this world. I mean, any, any avenue that you look in today, people just want to say I'm better or I'm the best. But lowliness of mind is humility, which is, and when we talk about humility, humility is the feeling or attitude that you have no special importance that makes you better than others. Okay? Humility is the feeling or attitude that you have no special importance that makes you better than others. Certainly anything that the Lord uses me to do, he can use somebody else. So I'm no better than the next person. And those who have fallen on hard times in life that we may see on the street corner with a sign asking for some change, we're no better. But for the grace of God, there go I. And in reality, you know, in the economy that we live in, any of us could slide and find ourselves wondering where our next meal is going to come from. Humility, an attitude that I'm, I'm not special or important to the point that it makes me better than others. When we allow the Holy Spirit to operate in this manner within our lives, that's when we will esteem others better than ourselves. That's not going to come out of flesh. It will not come out of carnality. That has to come through humility and submitting to the Holy Spirit. This goes against the grain of what we're taught in society to esteem others better. We will naturally have a concern for their needs and concerns. This sort of outward looking mentality naturally leads to a unity among the people of God. 
you know, if I consider you above me and you consider me above you, then a beautiful thing happens. We have a community where everyone is looked up to and no one is looked down on. I mean, when we can esteem others better than ourselves. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Here, the thought is completed. As we put away our selfish ambitions or conceit, our tendencies to be high-minded and self-absorbed, we will naturally have a greater concern for the interests and needs of others, which will keep our common identity, the Holy Spirit of promise in focus. That's our common identity, the Holy Spirit of promise. It is what unifies us. That is what brings us together, that same spirit, the Holy Spirit of promise. Paul doesn't tell us that it is wrong to look out for our own interests. He doesn't say it's wrong, but that we should not only look out for our own interests. We do need to take care of ourselves. We do need to take care of our families, but that we should not only look out for our own interests. We come to number two of the eight. Acknowledge our need for community. Acknowledge our need for community. I wonder tonight how many of you listening now have heard this said before. No man is an island. Question, and, and, and anyone, you can open the line on this. Is this scripture? Can you find this recorded in a verse in the Bible? Anyone? Uh, line is open. Anyone? Have you found this in the Bible? No man is an island. Praise the Lord. this. Praise the Lord, Valedictorian. Praise him. I, uh, I haven't read all the Bible completely like that, but I never ran across this phrase that heard anyone speak of no man is an island. Not in the Bible that it is. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sister Lawson. Okay. Now, I'm with Sister Lawson. I couldn't find it in the Bible. I searched for it. I've heard it that people have related that to the Bible, that no man is an island. But I couldn't find a verse that said that in the Bible. Uh, but I will say this, it goes along with what the word of God has to say about people and our need for community. Right? So although you may not find that specific quote in a verse, no man is an island, you know, you may not find it specifically stated that way, but it does speak to our need for community, which is what the Bible declares. Now, believe it or not, now, some of you may kind of, you know, grit your teeth a little bit on this comment, but believe it or not, we need one another. We need one another. Now, I mentioned this a couple of Sundays ago in our Sunday morning service at Greater Refuge. And it came out of my notes for this class tonight because it, it, what I was saying went along with what I had prepared for tonight. How many of you watched the Tom Hanks movie? Um, and I believe it was from 2000 and it was titled Castaway where he suffered a crash landing on a deserted island. And after spending enough time on that deserted island, he came across a volleyball. He drew a face on it and named this ball Wilson. He spoke to and 
befriended this ball in order to preserve some sense of his sanity. Now, some of us may think, wow, wow. Like, like I don't think I'd ever go that far to draw a face on a volleyball, name it, and make it my companion, my daily go-to, somebody I could talk to. I mean, just think about how lonely you have to be. And it gives us an illustration of how loneliness is. And as I stated at Refuge in that message that Sunday, you know, a lot of us right now listening, if someone gave us a week away and said, look, we're gonna put you up in one of the finest hotels, room service is all covered, every expense for a week, just you, do you. Any massages, therapy, anything you want, Manny Petty, do you. Everything is taken care of. I think probably just about every one of us here will say, when can it happen? Because it can't happen soon enough. We're ready for that. But at the end of that week, just you by yourself for a week, you, you're probably going to start thinking, I miss my children, I miss my companion, you know, my grandchildren. Because although we need a break, we don't look to be alone. And there's a difference. You know, there's a difference. And I think some of us experienced a little taste of this. You know, when March of 2020 hit us with COVID, when the shelter in place mandate was issued, you know, due to the deadly rapid spread of COVID-19. But we did have some connection. Thank God we were able to still connect and assemble through teleconference and then eventually Zoom, you know, which we're still making the most of even now. But I can remember one deacon making a statement during that shelter in place. He said, just taking my garbage down the driveway is a treat, you know, just getting out of the house. And it's something about loneliness and being separated and by yourself. That's not what God intended for man or mankind. Now, this thing, this example here with Tom Hanks, this was a movie. But listen to what the Lord had to say in Genesis 2.18. In Genesis 2.18, the Lord said, and this is not man talking, this is the Lord. It is not good that man should be alone. That's not man talking. That's the Lord talking. It is not good that the man should be alone. Now, you may be thinking, you know, but I'm an introvert or I'm an independent person, you know, which for the most part, I can understand. I can relate to it. That, that's me. Um, I can spend a whole day in silence, just hanging out by myself, my thoughts, you know, watch a TV show, take a nap, I'm good. You know, it's good that we all enjoy some alone time to catch up on our favorite show or read a book or perhaps just blow off some steam, you know, playing a video game. Some like to even catch up on some much needed sleep. But the fact is none of us, none of us, not even the most introverted would do well living in isolation. We need each other. And that's why even in the um, places of institution, when they put someone in solitaire, it affects their mental stability. It's good to be alone. And believe it or not, we need one another in the body of Christ to help us work through difficult times in our lives and even to rejoice with us when things are going well. You know, one of the things that I enjoy when there were challenges in my life, whether it was a success, challenge that I, the Lord blessed me to overcome, or whether it's a challenge that um, I was currently enduring. One of the things that I found blessed me and that I enjoyed was when I could come home and tell Loria. I could talk to her about it and say, you know, I was going through this at work and the Lord turned that around. This is what he did. 
had somebody I could come home and tell that to. Or if I was in a struggle, I could come home and tell her and know that she's going to listen and she's going to pray for me. So we need that. We, we need that sense of community, uh, someone that through difficult times in our lives, we can go to and we know they're praying for us. Or in times of victory, we know that they are there to rejoice with us and to celebrate that. We also need others to help us see areas where we need to grow and to pray for us. And, and saints, years ago, the late Bishop G.E. Patterson, I, I, I love listening to his messages on YouTube. And years ago, he I don't remember the text, but I remember a part of the message where he said, that years ago when he was coming up, the saints were soldiers and would sing songs like, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. They prepared for war. They had the mindset of war. He said, but somewhere as he's gotten older and he's looking at the church in his day as he's preaching this message, he says, we turned into a nursery. Now saints can't take anything. If you look at them funny, they're ready to leave. And when you think about it, we need others to help us see areas where we need to grow. If we really want to be what the Lord wants us to be, we can't be so sensitive. I mean, I know that we may not talk to people the way that they did in the 50s. It's very stern. We may try to do it in a different manner you know, but accomplish the same thing. But truth be told, sometimes it takes harsh reality. You know, and we're afraid to deal with harsh reality. Sometimes we need to, as the old saying, get down to where the tire meets the road. You know, we need others to help us see areas where we need to grow. If a person is spiritually stunted, and they come and talk to you, why would you hold back? And you don't have to say it in, in, in anger or to be hurtful, but you can say it in love. Let them know where they need to grow as the Lord given to you. You can say it with seasoning and grace. Yeah, yeah. Well, when I was in this position, I, I didn't realize how, how off I was. And such and such church mother came and spoke to me. This is what they said to me. And at the time, I didn't like it. But it turned out to be one of the greatest blessings in my life because it helped me. It wasn't what I wanted to hear, but it was what I needed to hear. We need others. We need one another to help us see the areas where we need to grow. And then not only acknowledge those, but pray for us. When we acknowledge our need for each other and do our best to live in community with other believers, it lays the foundation for maintaining and growing unity. Saints, let's take our feelings off our sleeves. I have had some things said to me that hurt. Oh, they hurt. But they were for my good. They were for my good. And I think that's probably why it hurt so much because it was true. And I had to make a decision. Are you going to waddle in this hurt? Or are you going to accept the truth of what's been given to you? And start to move forward and grow by it. Community among the children of God involves a sense of responsibility, love, fellowship, and unity. When you talk about community, you don't leave your brother and your sister hanging. Community among the children of God involves a sense of responsibility. I have a responsibility in the body. And if I don't carry out my responsibility, that load is going to fall on someone else. Now, how is that loving my brother or my sister when they have to carry my load? 
community among the children of God involves a sense of responsibility, love, fellowship, and unity. Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47 read this way. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Oh, Lord have mercy. Every time I read that, it makes me jealous. Every time I read Acts 2, 46 and 47, it makes me jealous. When I read the closing of verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved, can you imagine if every day in your local church family, souls were receiving the Holy Ghost? Can you imagine? And it's not about membership. It's not so that uh, one can say, well, we've got a thousand members. No. But it's a soul that will not face eternal damnation. My God, my God. If that's not enough, to spread the gospel, what is? We don't want anybody to be lost. If we can help it, save yourself. And them that hear you. Every time I read this, I get jealous. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. The church is meant to worship the Lord. And now let's remember, worship is not praise. Worship can involve praise. Worship is not praise. Worship is our daily walk. And it is submitting ourselves to him so that he is glorified. The church is meant to worship the Lord and learn his word together. Yet it's meant to do more. The Lord wants us to share our lives with one another. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. This is the Lord's prescription for church growth. No one wants to come into a divided family. No one wants to come off the street after the enemy has beaten them up and they feel like I need a place of refuge. And they walk into your place and see you scrapping, putting down one another. They'll look at that and say, well, I got that out there. What I need to be in here for. This is the Lord's prescription for church growth. Unity, internal unity at heart. Not faking it. I smile in your face, but I stab you in your back. No, not faking this thing. Real, real, internal humility and love. If we take care to follow the example of maintaining unity given here, the Lord will take care of growing the church himself. And with this growth, we learn to grow unity over time. Now, my goal tonight was to cover three of the first eight. I'm looking at the clock and I see that it is 824. And I have just concluded number two. So I know I've got about three or four pages of notes. No, yeah, I think I got about four pages of notes on number three. And I know that I'm not going to get all of that in before 830. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close here at two. Uh, and then what I had planned for tonight, I'll pick up the next time with, which is number three, stay humble. Um, I'll pick up that the next time. 
um, and, and begin there because I don't want to rush it because in staying humble, there's a very interesting lesson here uh, that is taught to us uh, through the first king of Israel, King Saul. When we talk about humility and staying humble, there's a very important lesson and I don't want to rush that. So what I'm going to do at this time is end it here of the eight, uh, we, we were able to cover two tonight. And those two were acknowledge our need for community and remember our common identity. These are two of the eight ways we can do our part to maintain and grow unity in the church over time. All right, so I'm going to yield now to our Dean Elder Bonet. He generally takes it from here. And if there's any questions, he'll open up for that. So Elder Bonet, it is in your hands. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. We definitely do thank, praise the Lord, the pastor and man was president of GRCC. Um, uh, uh, pastor of GRCC, president of CJBI, Elder John Betts for the lesson that we received, the continuation uh, praise the Lord uh, on this wonderful series. Uh, amen on the church. And um, uh, as always, each of the lessons, uh, praise the Lord, pertaining to the unity of the church uh, is uh, it just builds upon the next. And, you know, um, I'm amazed at how much information you continue to pour out that just seems so relevant and timely. Um that uh, yes, this is a reminder uh, to all of us, uh, amen, that, you know, uh, in terms of how we need to behave amongst each other um, is, uh, is, is extremely important, you know, and how the Lord, as we have read in the Revelation account, how he observes the works of what we do. And, um, you know, he, uh, you know, through the, uh, the work of the Holy Ghost is looking for perfect work. And how uh, the Holy Ghost is, uh, you know, um, um, determining what that perfect work is, uh, judging what is righteous, judging what is unrighteous and things of that sort. And so, you know, uh, it behooves every last one of us to make sure that we continue um, to examine ourselves, to police our own uh, personage, um, you know, uh, by doing what Jesus did when he came into Jerusalem. And, you know, cast out the money changes. We have to be just as aggressive and cast out all of these things that would, um, you know, um, you know, uh, become our identity. These things that should not be that would, you know, curtail us off the path of Christ. Um, but I believe personally that this uh, lesson was more of like a, a, a rod from the shepherd, you know, to help keep us in line. You know, it's important to know that, you know, uh, you know, we're not at war with each other. Um, you know, that we should not be at odds with each other. Uh, the scriptures have, have clearly concluded that we need to be uh, at peace with each other, you know, and, you know, if we run into a situation where we are not at peace with each other, there are rules that, you know, uh, we should govern ourselves by it so that we can obtain that peace. If you have ought with somebody, you go to that person, you know, uh, you know, they don't want to listen. You bring somebody with, they don't want to listen. Okay. All right. We bring them to the church. They don't want to listen. Okay, well, then, you know, there's really not much more you can do beyond that. Um, but you're doing everything you can so that you can, you know, uh, continue to generate and foster an atmosphere of peace. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have to love each other. And that's what the Bible also says, too, uh, on how we um, are seen by the world. And they, they can see and understand that we are the church and people of God because of how we love and adore each other. These are the type of behaviors and attitudes, spirit that you read when you uh, open up the book of Acts and how, you know, the church cared for each other to the point where they would sell their possessions and give to the needy of the church, you know, so that nobody was without, and everybody had that which was um, beneficial to them. Um, you know, I, you know, we, we're running into the extreme last days of the church age and uh, in this Laodicean age, you can see how the love of many is waxing cold, thus making it very difficult to maintain that type of personage and identity that the church must have. But, you know, that's why we have to work out our own salvation with, with fear and trembling. 
that's why it was important to uh, to listen to a lesson like this, uh, to that the Lord would have uh, touched and inspired Elder Best, praise the Lord, to uh, to bring unto us, you know, because uh, yes, we are living in a time where the love of many is waxing cold, but that doesn't mean that everybody's waxing cold, and that there are still those whom the Lord has reserved uh, seven thousand who has not bowed the, the knee to bail. You know, so we do work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. There will be a five wise versions that will make the rapture. You just want to make sure that you're in that number. We have to be in that number. And by adhering to the lesson uh, from Elder Betts today will help us to uh, be in that number. We take it to heart, meditate on it, and allow the Holy Ghost to continue to, uh, to nurture our understanding of it. Because there's still so much more to discuss as he himself has already said, look, I have more to talk about in, in pertaining to the unity of the church, you know, that, you know, it's just hard to contain within just what the time that we have here on a encouragement series call. But we do thank the Lord for what was given. And I, um, I'm i extremely excited about what was taught, um, and because now this is more knowledge that can be amassed in our minds and trickle down into our hearts for the Holy Ghost to then take and teach us how to apply it in our lives. So this is a wonderful lesson, um, uh, definitely something that, uh, um, you know, helps to even bolster the unity of the church series um, that that uh, uh, the Lord has blessed Elder Betts to give unto, uh, over this course of time. I hope you feel the same way. And before um, we end the service, praise the Lord, I'd like to invite anybody who has any questions for Elder Betts or comments, please uh, feel free. Amen. To ask them, say them in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody still writing their notes? Is that what it is? <laughs> Amen. Nobody has any questions or anything? Comments in Jesus' I'm name? Sure. Please, I don't have any questions right now, but I always, I always enjoy all the best, and it's an excellent teacher. So I had a very good time listening to him this evening. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Sister Lawson. Amen. Amen. Does anybody else have comments, questions? Amen. For Elder Betts, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, um, we definitely do thank the Lord for blessing us with the uh with the words. Yes, praise the Lord. Amen. Well, we definitely do thank the Lord with the words that were uh, delivered unto us this evening. Uh, truly, God is an awesome God who cares so much as he has to uh, be the good shepherd that he is, to feed us as, as properly as, as, and as eloquently as possible. He knows how to nourish us, give us just what we need. Why? For the hope and sake of having us stand with him in that, in that day. And um, um, I'm excited about that hope. Uh, let's just hold on to that hope and uh, take to heart what was taught, because personally, I do believe it was sent from heaven. And, um, you know, you don't want any of the, uh, uh, the words of God uh, to fall by the wayside. It's, it's just that much precious. And so uh, without further ado, uh, we will close out. Um, I do invite you all to come back next week, Thursday, for our next Encouragement Series session. Amen. Next Thursday, March the 16th. Uh, praise the Lord. We do invite you to come on back in Jesus name. Um, and um, for those who are interested, we are in our last week of registration for the Central Jersey Bible Institute um, and uh, for the 2023 spring semester. Uh, classes start this coming Monday. Praise the Lord. And we're offering four courses um, for those who are on Zoom. You can see uh, the flyers. Thank you, praise the Lord, Sister Miranda. But for those who are on the phone, I'll read to your hearing uh, in Jesus' name. We are offering a course entitled the uh, uh, Paul's General Epistle to the Romans, and this is taught by uh, Pastor Betts. Praise the Lord. We're also offering a course entitled the New Covenant First Century Gospel for the 21st Century Church. This will be taught by Elder Curtis Bracey. Amen. And we are also offering a course entitled Understanding People. Amen. And that uh, course will be um, instructed by uh, Elder Dwayne Qualls. And finally, we are offering a course entitled Isaiah and the Eagle Eye Prophecies Part 1. And that course is actually going to be taught by myself uh, in Jesus' name. So if you are interested in any one of these courses, you still have time to register. 
um, just reach out to myself or anyone else in the church family, and they will point you in the right direction for the Central Jersey Bible Institute. Or you can reach out directly by email. Uh, the email to the registrar is thecjbi600 at gmail.com. So this is all one word, T-H-E-C-J-B-I 600 at gmail.com. And just make it out to the attention to the registrar uh, that your intent is to take a course and she will reach out, reach back out to you uh, with the proper forms to get you going and ready for class. So we hope to see you there. And without further ado, uh, praise the Lord. Um, let us close out in Jesus' name. Let every heart pray. Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we love and thank you. We ask, Lord, that you will continue to bless us with your words and your ways. We do truly thank you for sending your manna down from upon high. We do truly thank, Lord God, for the inspiration that you have placed upon your man, servant, person of Elder John Betts. We ask that you continue to bless his ministry as well as his family, Lord God, that you will continue to make him sensitive to the move of your Holy Ghost, that he may know which direction that you would have him go. Bless him, bless us all, every participant on this call, Lord God, bless us and supply our needs naturally and spiritually. Make our homes harmonious for your Holy Ghost to move around in so that everyone in our house will be blessed. We ask, Lord, that you would rebuke the enemy from us and that you, Lord God, would encamp your heavenly angels about us and make us so sensitive to your small, still small voice speaking unto us. We love and thank you. Keep us rapture ready. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen and amen. Amen, everybody. We thank you for joining.